Good evening. As I said last month, the planet Saturn is now on view in the evening sky, rather low down in the south, looking like a bright star. And if you've got a telescope, you will see that wonderful system of rings. But what about this? It's Saturn, all right, but not the usual kind of view. That is taken not in ordinary light, but in infrared. I've talked about infrared astronomy often enough, particularly when IRS, the infrared astronomical satellite, was operating and sending back masses of information. I've also had a great deal to say about the Siding Spring Observatory in New South Wales, where the largest instrument is the AAT, or Anglo-Australian Telescope, one of the largest telescopes in the world, and um, arguably the best. Well, this evening, I want to combine the two, because we are delighted to welcome back one of our old friends, Dr. David Allen, all the way from Australia. Very glad to see you, David. Well, um, what's new at Siding Spring? Oh, Siding Spring's thriving these days, and we bringing up new instruments every now and then, and uh, I think everything's going very well. The weather's been a little bit mediocre, as it has this summer. Astronomers always complain about the weather. They do indeed. Well, I've seen the AAT in action, and I know what a superb telescope it is. And a little while ago, David Malin was over here, and he showed us some of these superb pictures he'd been taking with it. There is the Orion Nebula. But I know that you've been doing a lot of work with the AAT at infrared wavelengths. In a program a little while ago, we demonstrated that by using an infrared camera to see what happens when we switched on an electric fire. Well, we've still got the camera, but I think that your demonstration is much more dramatic. We thought we might try pointing this camera at a human being. Uh, in this case, it's going to be me. I'm the guinea pig. Here you see me now, as you would if you had infrared eyes. Now, the idea of uh, pointing this camera at me is to give you some idea of, of temperatures and the fact that the infrared is really sensitive to things that are at sort of body temperature, and that warm things are brighter and cool mm -hmm. things are darker. Yep. You can see, for example, my nose here looks a bit like a clown because <laughs> it's colder, and, and clearly when I point to it, I see my fingers are colder. Now, the infrared camera that we can put in the studio is, uh, of course, a very nice, uh, convenient demonstration, but it's not really suitable for astronomical use no. because it's not designed for seeing very faint objects. In order to uh, observe in the infrared, we have to take a tiny infrared detector, such as this one. Uh, this is um, a piece of indium antimonide. It's the standard material we use. It's mounted here on bits of gold and sapphire, and it all looks very impressive. There's about a thousand pounds worth there. Yeah. But right in the center of this, you can not really see it on the TV, a quarter of a millimeter in diameter, that's all, is the area that actually detects the little infrared detector. Now, that quarter millimeter, you have to realize, is sitting at the focus of this great four-meter telescope. We have this huge mirror feeding light down to this tiny quarter millimeter detector. Well, it turns out that that detector is a little bit fussy about uh, how it's used. Unlike the camera we've got in the studio, you can't use it at room temperature. You yeah. have to cool it. Now, cooling things is actually not as hard as it seems. We use liquid nitrogen. We've got a, a can of liquid nitrogen here. It's uh, easy stuff to handle. It's as cheap as beer. And I'm just going to kill them to me. <laughs> Oh, all right, harmless. <laughs> I'm just going to give a demonstration of uh, how it can cool things by dunking this banana skin. We, we enjoyed the banana earlier on, and now we're using the skin. And as you can see, it's making it boil a bit fearsomely. But this is a temperature of uh, minus 200 degrees, and if I give the banana skin a few seconds to get down to that sort of temperature, it'll come out quite unlike any banana skin you've ever handled in, uh, in your living room. It becomes brittle. Yes, now, that, that's a demonstration of how this liquid nitrogen cools things. Now, at the telescope, we actually have to cool the detector um, a little bit colder than this, and we have something a little bit more glorified than this can. You can see it here. It's the sort of a gold-colored part. Um, that's just a, a big thermos flask. Inside that, we have the detector, and behind that, masses of electronics, the big boxes of electronics. Even in the background, there's, there's racks of electronics which carry the information from this tiny little detector. It's amazing how techniques have evolved. You know, it doesn't seem so long ago that when an astronomer was using a really large telescope, he had to spend many hours in a cold, dark dome guiding his telescope. Well, that certainly doesn't happen nowadays, least of all, I suppose, with the AAT, which is just about the most computerized telescope in the world. That's certainly right. It's computers and electronics that have brought the observer into a warm, comfy room. Just as we're sitting in a studio here for observing at the AAT, we sit in a, an armchair, and we have our information brought to us. Here's a picture of me actually using the infrared equipment. You can see I've got all sorts of buttons and controls, and the information is coming out as a, a wiggly red line on the chart recording. 
That's the way astronomy is done these days. When you talk about infrared astronomy, I think one thinks automatically of distant stars and star systems. But there's quite a lot to be done, even in our own solar system. Even, I think, with our, my old friend, the Moon. Yes, uh, well, as an illustration, um, let's talk about the Moon. Think of the crater Theophilus. Uh, this is a nice, big, you know, visible crater, high walls, large central peak. Here's a nice optical photograph of it. 64 miles in diameter. I believe this photograph was taken by that world-renowned photographer P. Moore. <laughs> it was, yes. Yes. Uh, now, the infrared view of this uh, is slightly different because it was taken after the sun had set on Theophilus. There's a little bit of sunlit material, the sort of high walls on the left there, the lower left of the picture. But the whole of the rest of that is just glowing in the dark. Now, it's glowing because it's retained its warmth, and the brighter bits are warmer. However, there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. I mean, you might think that the slopes and the mountains saw the sun last and will stay warmer. But just how warm they stay depends on what they're made of. The dusty floor of the, of the crater, the soil on the moon, gets very cold at night, just like desert sand. It's hot during the day, but it doesn't yeah. draw in any heat, so no. it cools off quickly. Lumps of rock, uh, exposed rock faces on the walls, boulders, etc., soak up a lot of heat and radiate them out at night. And you can actually see these as, as bright infrared sources right through the lunar night. We could pick up Theophilus even before the sun rose. We've learned a lot from that kind of picture, but of course the moon is right on our doorstep cosmically. What about the planets? Yes, the, the most interesting planets are the ones that are covered with clouds. Uh, let's take Venus for a start. Uh, Venus, as you know, in the visible, is a very bright planet that's just covered with a thick layer, something like 50 or 60 kilometers of thickness of cloud that's reflecting the light back at us. In this infrared view, it is reflecting the sunlight in the, the upper part and it appears white. But down below, the lower half of it, which would normally appear dark, is actually glowing in the infrared because it's warm, just as I was glowing to the infrared camera. That's at a temperature of about minus 30 degrees Celsius, centigrade, a little bit cooler than I am. But it still shows up and we can see the features. It's fairly smooth. That's because the clouds rotate quite quickly. But it turns out that uh, there's an interesting discovery I made a couple of years ago um, on this dark part of the planet. You can see here um, a photograph or an infrared picture made when the planet is a rather narrow crescent, and the crescent's a bit burnt out on this picture up at the top. But on the dark side, there's all this detail and structure, dark patches, bright patches. This is a rather false color picture, but it shows the, the structure. Now, that structure was somewhat surprising. And nobody had anticipated that it would be visible. It appears to be due to the clouds that are low down in the atmosphere. I mean, we look as though we're seeing most of the way through to the surface of the planet and on the dark side at this wavelength, this, this particular way of doing the infrared observing. Yes, you did send us some of those pictures, and we showed them on the program some time ago. Right, when the discovery was made. But what I really enjoyed about that discovery was the fact that it was made from a, a ground-based telescope, yeah. a nice cheap system, and yet there have been satellites going round the planet for some years monitoring it, and they never thought to, to look. They didn't have the audacity. And moreover, the discovery was made in broad daylight. Shows what can be done. Indeed. Now, let's move outward in the solar system. Um, next cloud-covered planet, apart from the Earth, is Jupiter. This is an infrared view of Jupiter. And I've combined here three different um, colors. The blue is more or less as you'd see it in the visible with its stripes across it. You know, it's got the dark and the bright belts. But the green is showing something totally different. Notice, for example, up at the top, there's a bright patch. The polar caps of Jupiter are bright at this wavelength. The reason is that um, here we are looking at the gas methane, marsh gas, which absorbs the sunlight and makes the planet go dark. And the only place that light is sent back to us is where there is very little methane. And this happens to be where there's high altitude clouds up at the pole and in some of the other stripes. Now, the red part of this picture is also quite interesting. This is uh, a part where one's looking deep into the atmosphere. Now, Jupiter has some internal heat. It gets warmer as you go down. It's trying to be a star, but never quite succeeded. And here you're seeing where that heat is escaping through gaps between the clouds. These correspond to the dark belts that you see through a small telescope. So, in fact, if you, if you look at Jupiter through a small telescope and you see these dark belts, you can tell that's a region where you're looking deeper into it. Now, we can do the same sort of thing with Saturn. And the original picture that we started this program uh, showed only the rings, because there we were looking in the methane light, and the planet had disappeared. The rings are not made of methane. But in fact, the rings are made of ice, ordinary little ice cubes. And you can equally take a picture of Saturn in which the rings disappear and the planet <laughs> is visible. Or you can put the two together, as here, and you have the rings and the planet a totally different color, a rather weird view. <coughs> in the same way, we can look at uh, the planet Uranus. Now, you remember there's these 
set of narrow rings, rather faint features around the planet, which have been hardly photographed at all and are visible, very difficult to see. But by looking at Uranus in the methane light, the planet begets, becomes so dim that uh, you no longer have this great glare spreading out across the rings and hiding them, and so you get this sort of view. Uh, here, it's a little bit blotchy because it's a rather faint object, but you can see the rings completely going around the planet. That's because we happen to be looking at Uranus from essentially straight above the pole now. That's the best photograph so far taken, I think. What about the outermost giant, Neptune? Any result there, or is it too far away? Uh, we can look for rings. I have indeed had a go at uh, seeing the rings in the same way. But at the moment, Neptune is sitting right in the thick of uh, the Milky Way, yeah. and there are so many stars, it's very difficult to get a view of uh, Neptune without stars all over the places that the ring might be. Because well, there's quite a lot to be learned by looking at the solar system in infrared. But of course, it's when we come to stellar astronomy that infrared really comes into its own. For example, David, what about those regions where fresh stars are being created out of interstellar matter? It was believed a long time ago that infrared was going to hold the key to the formation of stars, the actual birth of stars, and to some extent this is true. Stars tend to form in very dark, murky regions. Their maternity wards are invisible to optical astronomers. Uh, let's take, for example, the Orion Nebula. Now, in the visible, as here, you see uh, young, bright stars illuminating a whole lot of gas. Uh, the stars are perhaps 100,000 years old or something. I mean, they're, they're fairly young by astronomical standards. But in fact, they are proper stars. They're not babies. When we turn to the infrared, we start to see further into the uh, nebula. <coughs> you can see here, all the blue parts, of, more or less as you saw in the previous picture, they're the, the young stars and the gas. But there's a lot of yellow material there. There are patches that are yellow. There are individual stars up near the top of the picture. There are a particularly large number of them there. That's a region where stars are still forming. Now, we can concentrate on um, the part where they're forming. And indeed, we've made a more detailed picture um, just of that. You see it here. Down in the lower left is the well-known group, the trapezium. All the little blue stars there are things that you can pick out with a normal telescope, uh, certainly a fairly large telescope, the recently formed stars. But now, up in the upper right, we have another group of stars, which is comparable in size to the trapezium. It's obviously a second growth center, but the stars there are a great deal younger. You can see there's different colored stars, there's sort of little bits of nebulae around there with, with no visible counterpart at all. Those stars are probably only a few thousand years old. And one of them, the very red one there, is perhaps the youngest and, and most active star we know. It's going through some sort of great slimming campaign, trying to settle down and become a star, doing very strange things. Well, Orion's out of view at the moment. It'll be back in the autumn. But at least we do have the lovely nebula Messier 8 in Sagittarius, the archer. Indeed. Uh, of course, that's particularly spectacular from Australia, where it goes nearly overhead. The central part of Messier 8 is a, a fairly bright uh, nebula. You see here in, in the, the blue part, it's shaped, they call it the hourglass, it's shaped a bit like an hourglass or an egg timer. There's a bright star nearby called Herschel 36 to the right of the center there. It was never quite clear whether Herschel 36 was actually lighting up the gas that made the hourglass or not. Now the infrared picture here shows a lot of little red stars again, as we saw in Orion, particularly on the right-hand half of the picture. So this is a region where stars are hidden and, and probably forming. Um, there's a lot of red nebulosity stretching from Herschel 36 right the way across to the hourglass. Again, this means that, that the nebula is sort of linked and Herschel 36 is, a, is indeed close to the hourglass. But I think perhaps the most interesting thing is the little red star that's formed in the waist of the hourglass, right in the middle. Now that's only shown up with the infrared, and what we think is going on here is that the star is young and is still surrounded by a ring, a, a donut-shaped ring of dust and gas and the sort of stuff that it eventually will turn into planets. So you've got this, this ring with a star in the middle. Now, of course, if you look at the ring edge on, you're trying to look through it, and it's just opaque. Only the infrared sees through to the star, and the visible you don't see. But if this is the ring, then the light can get out to either end, and that illuminates these bright fans of light, which give the hourglass appearance. Astronomers have found quite a lot of these sorts of objects, and they call them bipolar nebulae, because they come out of sort of two yeah. poles. Uh, we can see, actually, similar things. We've been talking about the youth of stars, but in old age, some stars produce the same sort of thing. A uh, star like the sun, or a bit bigger, will eventually swell to be a sort of a, a red giant star, swallowing up the Earth in size. And it may then do what this object has done. I won't bother, with your name, bother you with the name of this object, which is a bit complicated, but it's something that's only seen in the infrared. There's no optical counterpart. And you can see these great long sort of jets of gas blowing up to the upper left and down to the lower right off a star which is 
lost somewhere in the middle. It's produced the same sort of donut-shaped ring itself, and it's thrown material off. Um, exactly why it's done that isn't really clear, but it's been quite dramatic. One's looking at a scale there, which is some tens of thousands of times as big as our solar system. What about that decided and mysterious region, the center of the galaxy, which we can't actually see, in something like 30,000 light years away, beyond the star clouds in Sagittarius? What can infrared tell us about that? The reason we can't see that invisible is because of all the dust and gas and so on in our galaxy. There's a sort of interstellar smog, which is opaque. The infrared goes right through that, and the infrared view of the center of the galaxy looks like this. This is a small region, very close to what we believe to be the true center. And you can see there are different colored stars. There are red stars and blue stars and so on, uh, different types. Now, that's more or less the view that you would get if you had infrared eyesight. We've actually put together recently a, a rather different picture. This, this one's my entry to a modern art gallery. Yeah, I can see that. Um, the blue parts of this are actually an optical picture, and they're the, the nearby stars in, in Sagittarius. The red part is what the radio astronomers have seen, and the green part is what we see in the infrared. Now, um, we've put these together very carefully to work out what's going on. The true center of the galaxy, as best we can tell, is the thing that looks rather pink on this picture, slightly to the right of center. It's a very strong radio source, therefore a red object, but it happens to have a little foreground star almost on top of it, just to confuse us. Now, <coughs> the, uh, the radio is very strong there, but the infrared is not strong. You see there's, there's no contribution from green in that picture. So it's a very weak infrared source. Now, there are strange things going on in the middle of the galaxy, coming, we think, from that region. There's X-ray emission, there's gamma ray emission, and so on. And people have argued this is a, a black hole, right, um, with perhaps a mass of a million times that of the sun. But the fact that we've now demonstrated that it's very weak in the infrared shows that, in fact, it's a very small black hole. It can't be more than about 100 times, or perhaps a couple of hundred times as heavy as the sun. It's only a baby. You know, we've heard a great deal about black holes recently, and I think some astronomers tend to regard them as a remedy for everything. Do you think they exist, David? I have been skeptical in the past of black holes, and I'm not sure even now that we've really proved that they exist. But I think that we're, we're building up a, a picture um, of them as being quite reasonable objects. We think that they could have been formed early on in the universe. We think we can see how they would have evolved. And we're beginning to suspect we can find them in places like the center of our galaxy. It's hard to explain what's going on there in any other way. Well, so I'm coming to believe in them. Well, there's a lot to learn. What do you think of the immediate prospect for infrared astronomy, and what are you planning for the immediate future with the AAT? Well, infrared astronomy remains tremendously healthy. It's been going for 10 or 15 years, and it's completely revolutionized our ideas. And the IRS satellite you mentioned at the beginning has been particularly important. And certainly at the AAT, we intend to continue our work. In fact, only a few weeks ago, we uh, commissioned a new instrument, built and tested it out on the telescope. This instrument will give us the sort of power that optical astronomers have using spectroscopy uh, in the infrared. I mean, it'll open up all sorts of new channels. And the first thing we want to do is tackle the center of the galaxy with it. When do you think we'll have that in operation? Hopefully within the next month or two. Um, in time for Halley's Comet? <laughs> Indeed, it will be in time for Halley's Comet. This will give us a, a, a new way of uh, studying the comet, and no comet has been looked at in this sort of way before, so I'm sure we'll be trying it on Halley. Well, certainly there is a tremendous lot coming out of Siding Spring, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more in the very near future. Well, David, thank you very much indeed for coming over and giving us the latest news about this really exciting branch of astronomy. So, we hope to see you again before very long. Meanwhile, from David and myself, good night. And you can see that programme again next Saturday at 6.15 on BBC Two.